Hi, I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. And today I'm really excited because we have with us all the way over from across the pond over there in that, I think they still call it England, but I'm not sure. We've got none other than Simon Baron Cohn, the author of this, The Pattern Seekers. That's like the new Bible about autism. And Simon, thank you so much for being with us here. I'm really um, privileged to be part of your show. Thank you for inviting me. You see, you see, with that accent, you could say whatever you want. See, I'm from Jersey City. My folks had a gas station there. So okay. whatever I say doesn't come out as good as what you say. You say good stuff. No, no, no. You sound cool. <laughs> well, uh, let me tell you, my executive function is lacking. So, of course... I finished your book um, at about eight o'clock this morning, and it was great. It was excellent. Thank you. And um, uh, I couldn't wait to do this uh, interview. But first, before we get started on your book, um, why don't you introduce yourself properly and tell people what you're doing and who you are? Sure. So, um, so Simon Baron Cohen, and I, I'm a psychologist. I've been researching autism for. 35 years. And, um, you know, as, as you've just announced, I've written this new book, which is exploring a, a question, is there a link between autism and human invention? And on the face of it, we wouldn't expect there to be a link. You know, autism is a disability. Invention is uh, kind of one of the crowning achievements of our species. Uh, and yet the book kind of unpacks a lot of evidence to suggest that there is a link and maybe we could talk about it. Well, we are going to talk about it because it's amazing how you go back a uh, short uh, 70,000 years or so. Exactly. I can't remember last Tuesday, but that's all right. You know? <laughs> um, and, yes, I, so I take this kind of evolutionary view. When I was thinking about invention, we have to kind of think, when did, it, when did invention begin? And are we the only species that can invent, which I argue we are. And uh, I take us back 70 to 100,000 years ago, when we see humans, homo sapiens, creating what I call complex tools, but also inventing unstoppably. They're not just inventing one or two things, they're, they're coming up with a whole, range of, of new ideas, new, new devices, new tools. Whereas, if you go back the previous two million years, our ancestors were doing very little inventing. You know, they would make stone axes to cut meat from the bone, or they'd use a, a stone to, as a hammer to crack a nut. But there was very little kind of change in the design of their, of their tools, very little complexity very little novelty. And then around, you know, 70,000 years ago, we see the first, um, well, we see the bow and arrow, which I think is, is um, quite a, an amazing new weapon. It's an invention. Uh, we see the first jewelry. So someone has the idea to invent jewelry. It was a necklace. We see the first musical instrument, which was a, a flute made out of a bone the first sculpture, the first cave paintings, you know, the list goes on. You know, that's where we can see a big change happen in the human brain. That, that's my argument. That something changed in the human brain. And that's what I explore. And you explored very well. I was, uh, I was shocked to uh, learn about the different sizes of our brains as time went on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And also, the, um, the uh, examples you gave from the animal kingdom, how that's not really creating or inventing. And could yeah. you talk a little bit about the if-then? Yeah, exactly. So, so what I argue in the book um, is that there were two big changes in the human brain, the modern homo sapiens brain. One of them is what I call the systemizing mechanism. So this allowed us for the first time to see patterns or systems out in the world. And a system is what I call an if and then pattern. So if we take the bow and arrow, if you just follow the logic, 
if I attach an arrow to a stretchy fiber and I release the tension in the fiber, then the arrow will fly. So it's taking a starting point. Engineers call this the input. That's the if. And then you're doing something to the input. That's the and. And I do something. It's often something causal. And the then is the output. What you know? What does the what does the system produce? And we see it in the in the in the bow and arrow. But if we take the the musical instrument, that flute, the same logic, the same algorithm is at work. So if I blow down this hollow bone, and I cover one hole, then I produce a particular note. But if I blow down the hollow bone and uncover the hole then I get a different note. And suddenly we can see our Homo sapiens ancestors, this, this goes back 40,000 years, inventing a new tool, a musical instrument, but also inventing a whole new system of notes, which we call music, and you know, which we still enjoy. So you know, that, that uh, ability to see these special new patterns, if and then, um, that's what I say is one of the, the big changes in the human brain. And we're still inventing today. We're inventing vaccines against COVID. We're putting Wi-Fi on the moon. That's in the plans. You know, we're, we're unstoppable inventors. <laughs> and now we fast forward to, to now. Okay. And we say that, uh, well, Simon Baron Cohn thinks there's five kinds of brains, which are really... Yeah variations of two kinds of qualities in a brain so yeah you got the people who are good at systematizing yeah then you got the people who are good at empathizing exactly and then you break them up into different categories you basically got five kinds of brains with varying degrees of each yeah yeah so you know i said that um there was a big revolution in the human brain 70,000 years ago, 70 to 100, it's that time window. And I talked about the systemizing mechanism as one of the big changes, but the other big change was the empathy circuit. It's the ability to imagine what someone else is thinking. You know, you and I are having this conversation and the only reason the conversation has any chance of going well is because we're trying to keep track of what each other is thinking what each other might want to say, might want to be interested in. We're keeping track of what's in another person's head. And again, when you, when you look back at the archaeological record, you know, our ancestors weren't just making jewelry like a gadget. They were probably imagining, what would somebody else think if I wore this, this jewelry? You know, how would I be perceived by somebody else? Or if it was intended as a gift, you know, what would this person feel if I gave them this jewelry? You know, would they enjoy it? You know, so we're thinking about each other's thoughts and feelings. The same with the musical instrument. It wasn't just an invention like a new gadget. The maker of the instrument was probably thinking, you know, would the audience who listens to me play this music enjoy it? Would they think I'm trying to communicate with them? You know, so there's systemizing which I argue underlies invention, but there's empathy, which gives us a whole new way of interacting. It allows communication, it allows deception, where we can sort of keep track of what somebody else knows or doesn't know or might believe. It allows teaching, where we can imagine that somebody might not have the relevant information, so we have to give it to them. It's a whole new set of social behaviors. But back to this idea of, you know, Let's look at people today. When you ask people to take measures of systemizing and of empathy, you're right, you see different profiles in the population. We, we categorize people into five different types of brain. So type S are people who are better at systemizing. Type E are people who are better at empathy. Type B is balanced, people who are equally good at both. And then there are the extremes. The extreme of type S are people who are systemizing nonstop. They see patterns everywhere, but they may find empathy quite challenging. And then the mirror image of that is the extreme of type E, people who empathize nonstop 
They're always worrying about what other people are thinking and feeling, but they may not be looking for patterns particularly or very interested in gadgets and how things work. And it's right here where you run into the Simon Baron Cohn controversial area. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but based mm. on what I just read, sure. um, the empathizing, the empathizing brain is more of a female characteristic, and mm -hmm. the systematizing brain more of a male characteristic. Now, why yeah. don't you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm a scientist. That's not meant to be like a sort of get out of jail card. <laughs> but um, what we, we, we did, a, did this, we did a very big study. It was over half a million people. We gave these measures of empathy and systemizing. And just as you say, what did the data show? It showed that on average, there were more women in the population that um, had a preference towards empathy than systemizing. And then on average, more males in the population who had a bias towards patterns and systems. So this is just simply what the data is telling us, you know, and it's not true of all males or all females, that would be a kind of misinterpretation. Um, so, you know, uh, somebody may be typical or atypical for their sex, but you're right, it's controversial. Anytime anyone talks about sex differences or gender differences, you know, it's going to be a bit of a political minefield. Um, and I explore this a little bit in the book. But the book is more about maybe the bigger surprise, which is that in our, in our big study, 36,000 autistic people took part. It was an online study, one of the largest studies of autism that's ever been conducted. And what we found was they were much more likely to be type S or extreme type S. So systemizers or hyper systemizers. Um, and we know that autism is, you know, is all about struggling with social relationships, struggling with communication. But that's the kind of disability side. Alongside their disability, these are individuals who, um, who are very interested, they're almost magnetically drawn to systems, to understanding how objects work. So that was the first clue that systemizing, which is what we needed for invention across the last 100,000 years, seems to be a profile that's more common in autistic people. Uh, a second clue was that when we took the half a million people who took part and divided them into people who work in STEM, science, technology, engineering, or math, or people who don't work in STEM, the people who work in STEM have more autistic traits. So again, we're seeing this link that if you have an aptitude for invention, for understanding patterns, it goes hand in hand with having more autistic traits. So that was, you know, a, a I said at the beginning of this, of this program, we, you know, why would we even sort of predict such a link? And yet the link seems to be there. And then the last big clue, which I'll, you know, then I'll see your reaction is, is in the DNA. Because we, we had the opportunity to work with this company called 23andMe. You may have heard of them. Where, you, <laughs> you know, you, you, pay, you pay $100 or whatever it is, and they'll tell you what, what's inside your genes. Um, and these people had taken our questionnaires, the systemizing questions, the empathy questions. And what we found was that the people who score higher in systemizing, they carry genes that overlap with the genes that are found in autism. So even at the molecular level, there's a link between this capacity for invention, for seeing patterns and understanding how they work, and autism. And so you can take a kind of, you can draw a conclusion or an inference that if that's true today, it was probably true all the way back because our DNA hasn't changed that much. You know, so autistic people may have been contributing to human progress in their ability to, to see patterns. I found myself a little bit uncomfortable, uh, yet I recognized the 
objectivity of it. Uh, in the use of a term that we hear at differentbrains.org, we try to avoid the term, not extremely, but we talk about differences. Yeah. And we try to stay away from what really does exist in certain aspects, which are disabilities. Right. And today being International People with Disabilities Day, I forgot the exact uh, name of it. Sure. Give us because you did a very good job, I thought, in the in your book right. about discriminating between these two things. And I don't think we should no. be afraid by no. uh, not being politically correct to saying, you know, when somebody's got a problem yeah. that keeps them from thriving, we've got yeah. to we've got to give someone with poor eyesight uh, some glasses. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Just so that you don't feel all alone. I'll put mine on too. And whilst we're at it, this was an invention, right? You know, we're celebrating the human capacity for invention, right? No other species has come up with things like this, you know. Yeah, but, but anyway, to tell you how far I've evolved, mine are from the dollar store. I don't know where yours are from. Okay. <laughs> um, well, as I have to say they look very fashionable. They look very cool. <laughs> um, let's go back to your question, though because it's not just about difference and disability. Uh, in my book, I, I talk about the four Ds. So difference, disability, disorder, and disease. You know, and I'm, I'm guessing you don't like any of those last few Ds, but- No, you know, no, I enjoyed, I enjoyed, enjoy is the wrong word. I heartily endorse when you separate something like epilepsy. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. by the way, the way I've thought of this holistically, and the reason I started different brains is because I found everything was in different sides. So you had the mental health issues over here, PTSD and depression, and you had neurological issues like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's over here and epilepsy. Sure. And then over yeah. here, you had neurologic, you had uh, developmental and learning differences. Yeah. And they all, all overlap. You can't have Absolutely. autism without a little no, bit of anxiety. Exactly. So, yeah. So, so my, you know, the view I've come to, instead of kind of arguing between ourselves as to is autism a difference, a disability, a disorder, a disease, Actually, depending on which aspect of autism you're talking about, all four of these Ds may apply. So I would say there's plenty of evidence that it's a difference, that these are individuals who uh, are fascinated by patterns to a much higher degree. They have excellent attention to detail. Sometimes they have phenomenal memory. So these are just differences. They certainly are not disabilities, right? Uh, but there is evidence of disability because sometimes they develop more slowly in terms of social skills or in terms of language development. And these things can cause, uh, can cause difficulties. So if somebody is struggling, if somebody is having a hard time and they need a diagnosis to get support, I would say that's evidence of a disability. Difference by itself doesn't need support, right? But disability may do. And then disorder, well, the American Psychiatric Association, as you know, calls everything a disorder. <laughs> I'm not, you know, but disorder just means that the person is suffering, but we don't know the cause. If we know the cause, then you can call it a, a disease. So, you know, epilepsy is a good example of a disease because sometimes we know the precise location in the brain, the temporal lobe epile epilepsy, we might even know the gene that's a mutation that's causing it. So you could track it right down to, to a, a causal mechanism. And, and in some autistic people, they do have epilepsy. Some autistic people have gastrointestinal pain, you know, which is certainly a disorder. They want to be free of it. Uh, some autistic people have learning difficulties, which we might argue is a disability. So there's kind of space for all of these descriptions, I think. But the most and that important catapults us into. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. But Go that ahead. catapults us into a great point you made in the book that Temple Grandin agrees with you 100 percent, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Employment. Okay? Yeah. 
Yeah. What's going to stop you from getting employed? And you gave that very poignant example of hmm. the uh, uh, the young man thinking about suicide. Yeah, uh, because Jonah. he couldn't yeah. be independent and, and get a job. Yeah. Um, so those things that are going to prevent you from getting employment and yeah. what I call independence. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that. Let's go into yeah. that. From so in the book, I tell the story about Jonah. You know, chapter one even opens with a description of what he's like in the playground at school as a, as a two-year-old, a three-year-old, delayed in language. But then we meet him later in the book, and he's a young man of 40. Um, he's been applying for over 400 jobs, and he hasn't got a single reply. And he's, he's got depression, as any of us would. You know, we know that unemployment is not good for your mental health. And it turns out the majority of autistic adults are unemployed. And we could try and think, what are the barriers to employment? Why aren't they getting a job? It could be because they've dropped out of high school without you know, formal educational qualifications, because a lot of them have a miserable time at school, uh, because they have a different learning style, not disabled, but different, but it just doesn't fit learning in a crowded, sociable, noisy classroom. It could be that. It could be that when they, if they got, you know, if they got shortlisted and they got called for an interview for a job, that the way our interviews work, you're, you're expected to make eye contact, you're expected to be able to read between the lines and say socially appropriate things. You know, the, these are exactly the areas of disability in autism. So the selection process might be discriminating against them in terms of their disability. Um, either way, I, I find it a kind of human tragedy that the majority of autistic adults, despite having good intelligence, are wasting away, you know, not doing anything meaningful or purposeful, um, feeling excluded by society because most of us feel we belong in society because we work. We have colleagues, we, we chat, you know, we feel included. Uh, autistic people want just the same as us, but somehow there are barriers and we just need to get the message out to employers that if they hire an autistic person, they're bringing in a different kind of diversity. People are now talking a lot about neurodiversity. So you have somebody who thinks differently. Uh, the book makes the claim that autistic people may not just think differently, may come up with new solutions for old problems. You know, so we might get invention or innovation in the team. Um, and often the employer doesn't have to make big changes to accommodate an autistic person. You know, we talk about reasonable adjustments, but maybe the autistic person just needs to have a quiet space, not in an open plan office, which is too distracting, overwhelming on their senses. Just let them get on with their work quietly. Maybe we shouldn't expect them to join us for lunch every day because they don't like chatting, but just let them be themselves and let them contribute to the productivity of, 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 their, of their workplace. I was recently asked to be on a panel of, with real experts like yourself, of, but psychologists and psychiatrists, not neurodiversity experts. And it was on teen suicide and depression. And I felt very uncomfortable because I'm not a professional. I'm just neurodiversity, you know? But they didn't know any of the statistics like high functioning autism has sometimes up to 10 times the rate of suicide attempts, yeah. ADHD three times the amount, and they're yeah. dealing with yeah. them on their suicide lines and they don't know, they're not trained, right. yeah. which is one of the reasons I wanna help mainstream your works and your book, cause you know more under your fingernails. And right. unlike me, you are a, you're a real researcher, you're a real- uh, Well, we did, we did, we did that, that first piece of research documenting the, um, the sort of unacceptably high levels of suicidality in autistic adults. So we found, we, we've got a clinic here in Cambridge and we just, you know, we just asked the patients who come to the clinic to get a diagnosis of autism. Two thirds of them had felt suicidal and one third had attempted suicide. You know, and and these, 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 aren't, these are people who are, are born 
to, to, to go on to develop autism. But autism doesn't need to entail suicidal feelings or feeling so desperate. You know, if you're feeling suicidal, it's because you haven't been supported. You haven't found a niche where you feel you belong. And I think the, the world of work could make a big difference. So I, you know, I'm very pleased that SAP are doing this in the in the IT sector, but we need to open it up to every sector. You know, whether it's whether it's the local bicycle store, because autistic people could fix bicycles, or whether it's the local bakery, because autistic people could bake wonderful well, bread. You know, and yeah, and you've just segued into a, a, a very interesting um, what I found. Um, issue with the parents, okay? I was presenting once at the Florida Atlantic University and um, one of, I, I showed slides of my family's gas station in Jersey City and, and I, uh, I showed my mother pumping gas, but I also showed uh, um, the rising tide car wash here in South Florida, which only employs autistic individuals. Fantastic. I thought it was a good model because the brother and father made it because their brother was autistic. Yeah. And I take my truck there and I was saying what they love their work. They're paying attention to detail. Yeah. I love this and, idea. Uh, you know, the, ex and the example is great. It's you know, a great example, I thought. So, well, so what, what I was well, going to say I is. Got I got interrupted by a, a woman who was very offended by this. Said, my son should be doing something better than washing cars. I said, my father was in a gas station. <laughs> yeah. Like, what are you talking about? Not everybody's yeah. going to be a computer whiz. But go Absolutely. ahead. I'm sorry. To no, 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 no. I mean, first of all, I think it's a great example. Um, well, several points. My, my, my big point, I guess, in, in response to that woman who, who spoke to you that way, would be to say that there's dignity in every kind of work. Right, you know, we need our cars washed, and we need computer programs written, and one isn't better than the other. We need both, right? Yes. Uh, but the second point is that whether you're talking about the car wash or the computer program, it's the same logic we spoke about earlier. This if and then, you know, that you can find a system in many different types of work. When you wash a car, you you have to use particular materials particular you know ingredients in the wash um, and when you're you know when you're doing math again you have to you have to use that if and then logic if I take the number three and I cube it then I get 27 you know it's this it's that kind of logic and autistic people love these patterns these rules and you know where invention comes in is that once you know the rule you can start to play with the variables in the in the pattern so instead of saying, I'll take the number three, you can say, I'll take the number four, you know, and then see how that plays out in the system. Um, so I think autistic people, you know, they've got um, assets or strengths or even talents that would lend themselves to many types of work. And I think it's time, you know, for us as a society to be kind of welcoming autistic people you know, they've been contributing, this is the theory in the book, they've been contributing to human progress. They've made the planet what it is today. The fact that we can even have this conversation through Zoom, you know, these kinds of platforms were probably invented by autistic people. Certainly Skype, which is the one of the first examples, was invented by a Danish guy who dropped out of school, um, you know, uh, he, he, he thought differently. He didn't have a formal diagnosis of autism. But, you know, we owe them a lot of, we owe them a lot. And yet the way we show our gratitude is to leave them outside of society, to leave them suicidal, uh, in poverty. You know, it's time to change. Is there anything we have not covered that you would like to cover? Hmm. Uh, maybe two things. Um, one thing that you may have seen in the book, it's called The Pattern Seekers, was um, a study we carried out in Silicon Valley. Um, because if, 
if the if parents who are good at invention and good at with good with systems are carrying the genes for autism because we think they are, they're ver- they are the very same genes then we should expect that in places like silicon valley we might see much higher rates of autism right so we we didn't go to silicon valley california because it's quite far away from where i live you can <laughs> hear my accent we went to a silicon valley closer to home in the Netherlands to a city called Eindhoven. Eindhoven has had the Philips factory there for a hundred years. So it's been attracting people who are good at technology for at least three generations. And they settle there, they have kids. And Eindhoven also has uh, an institute of technology, a bit like MIT. So it's a kind of hub for systemizers. What we found was that autism rates were twice as high in that city compared to two other cities in the Netherlands that was matched for size, for other demographics. So it was giving us another clue that the genes for systemizing for invention are also linked to the genes for autism. And I just hope that this kind of research will change the way we think about autism. We used to just focus on the the negative side, the disability side, you know, the areas of difficulty. But this is kind of making, it's forcing us to rethink autism. That autism isn't just disability, it's also difference and even talent. And it's right there in the genes. Beautiful, absolutely. Um, I was talking once to a psychologist out in Silicon Valley, yeah, who was not a specialist in autism, and, and but he, well, uh, we were having a conversation And I was saying to him, and he was saying, well, autism is genetic. And I said, well, I think it's multifactorial and, you know, a lot of things. Yeah. And he got very angry with me. He said, Hacky, you know where I am? I'm out in Silicon Valley. I said, yeah. He goes, Hacky, do you know what I do? He goes, let me tell you what happens here. They all come here to work for Google and Microsoft. Right. And And you know what they do? They meet each other. Yeah. And then you know what they do? They breed. Sure. You no, know who has to take care of all of their kids who have autism? Me. <laughs> so don't, don't tell me yeah. it's not genetic. Yeah. And you know, I think, so, I think what I would say is you're you're both right. I'm not just being <laughs> diplomatic here. I mean, he's right because the evidence is coming out that autism is is genetic, but it's only partly genetic. We also know you can have identical twins where one is autistic and one isn't. So if it was 100% genetic, you know, with identical twins, if one has it, the other one should also have it. So we know that there's also some non-genetic factors that play a role in, you know, increasing the likelihood of autism. We've been looking at hormones in the womb, testosterone and estrogen, as I mentioned, because the hormones themselves change brain development. And that might be an example of an environmental factor. It's the kind of ho- the, the uterine environment that might also be affecting brain development to increase the likelihood of autism. Uh, but there may be other factors still to be uncovered. It's not, it's not all genetics, that's what I'm trying to say. Well, I, I have to say in the appendix of your book, mm. Pat Seekers, I, uh, I took that uh, test to... Uh, Try to find see the cube in the diagram. Right. I was going a very long time, and I'm going, well, wait till, wait till I talk to Simon. He just right, right. I don't know what that makes me, but it was no. it was yeah, tough. Where, no, but whereas when we give that test to autistic people, you have to find it's like finding the piece within the whole. It's like like seeing a jigsaw piece. You know, they're they're super quick, super accurate at, at that kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, so we've just been missing the, the, the positive side of autism for decades. We've been focusing on what they struggle with, not what they can actually do differently or even better than non-autistic people. Well, Simon Baron Cohn, thank you so much for spending time with us. It's been very, very educational for me and inspirational. And we are all going to read this book because I just did and I learned a whole lot. And so keep up your great work and I hope you'll come back soon to Different Brains. Thank you. 
Thank you, Haki. I hope you invite me back. Exploring Different Brains is a production of Different Brains. Visit us at differentbrains.org.